Mario Sarami. I'm a board member with the Civic IC and I used to be in the North Vancouver Committee. Uh, as you know, the provincial elections are coming up on May 9th and uh, we hope that this event, which features MLA candidates from North Vancouver Lonsdale, North Vancouver Seymour, and North Vancouver Capilano, will help you learn more about the candidates and give you more information and let you make an informed decision. Uh, I'd also like to introduce the Civic IC in case you're not familiar with us. Uh, we're a nonpartisan, nonprofit socio political association in Vancouver dedicated to advancing the interests of the Iranian Canadian community. And uh, we've been active since 2010 and have put on uh, all kinds of debates, both federally and provincially, since, since then. And I'd also like to acknowledge our many supporters, uh, different organizations, businesses, and groups. Uh, they include the Canadian Iranian Foundation, the Farhang Young Educators Association, Society of Iranian Canadian Professionals, Greater Vancouver Counseling and Education Society for Families, United Court Society of Canada, Iranian Canadian Bird Abuse Association, Tri City Chinese Canadian Association, who's been kind enough to provide us with volunteers today, Aria TV, TV, Farhang Newspaper, Hamir Media, and the Iranian Canadian Congress. Uh, also, we have uh, two businesses here who uh, are represented, an uh, investors group, and also uh, back there, um, uh, I forget the name, but uh, she has very unique jewelry. And uh, we invite you to uh, visit them at your leisure. We have a 10 minute break period between the question and period, so. Um, so the format of the event is two 30 minute question periods. Uh, the first one will be questions that the Civic IC will ask, they'll be more general. Uh, and the second period will be audience questions and we'll have a 10 minute break in the middle. Uh, for the audience, uh, please write down your questions uh, right now or during the break and give it to one of our volunteers. Uh, they'll be compiled and we will go through them. Sometimes the questions are repetitive or not relevant, so we'll uh, try to ask the most relevant questions considering the time constraint. And uh, we ask you to have a respectful tone for the questions and keep them as short and precise as possible. And I also want to let you know that there are two more debates coming up, uh, set up by the Civic IC prior to the election. One of them is on April 22nd, which is Saturday, uh, for Burnaby, being held at the McGill Library. And uh, the other one is for Coquitlam on April 29th uh, at the Coquitlam Library. And we have more information at the Civic IC table if you uh, want to attend any of these or know people who reside in those writings, that would be great. Uh, so right now I just uh, wanted to let the candidates have uh, two minutes to introduce themselves. Uh, shorter would be better, of course. Um, and after that we'll go through the rules for the question period and we'll start then. Thank you. Um, I don't know if I need a microphone. Um, lady in the back, young lady, can you hear me all right? Okay, great. Um, thank you for coming. Thank you to the people who organized this sort of thing. This is important. This is the chance for us to get our message out to you. You have a very important decision to make. It's about the future of BC, the direction and the focus that we're going to take. Um, if some of us seem a little nervous today, and I know I am, it's because we care about this. This is important. But thank you for listening to us, and thank you for letting us listen to you. Um, my name is Richard Warrington. I happen to represent the Green Party. That's uh, not by accident, maybe, but I am certainly not any career politician. I'm a teacher, father of two. I have big experience with the public sector, the private sector. I happened to live in Denmark for 25 years, and I was inspired by a society that was so well informed, so democratic, and according to the UN happiness um, scale, they're the second happiest people on the planet. So I thought, that's interesting. And having lived there for 35 or 25 years, I learned a lot about how that worked. When I moved back here four and a half years ago, I thought, well, I maybe could do something in politics. The Green Party found me more than I found them. I certainly wasn't looking. I was as jaded and cynical about politics as many other people are. But are there people that cannot hear me? Use the mic. Use the mic, please. Yeah. yeah. I can project. Being a teacher, I'm used to talking loud. Um, 
I'd rather not use the microphone. Is that okay for everybody? No. 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 Okay. I hope this goes well. Okay, I'm turning on. How's that? Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm just about finished because I think my two minutes is also finished as well. So I'll pass the microphone on to the next person. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Joshua Johnson. I'm the Green Party candidate for North Vancouver Seymour. Uh, I'm honored to be participating in the forum today, so thank you very much for having me. I'm 19 years old, and I decided to run this election because I really didn't feel that the politicians today uh, were considering uh, the issues facing my generation. Uh, the youngest demographic is the least likely to vote despite the fact that we are the most affected by the policies being put forward today. I want to change that. I want to change the way that we look at issues fundamentally and provide a different approach that advocates forward-thinking policies. These policies hopefully will benefit not only the pocketbooks of today's voters, but will improve the quality of life for generations to come. We need to start thinking about the effects that the issues that we're talking about today are going to have. Unaffordable housing and lack of housing supply, driving away new home buyers and new homeowners and new members of our community. Low wages and high cost of living, forcing working people to look elsewhere. And we continue to spew pollution into the air, building up the oil and gas industry at the detriment to our natural environment. I'm running to advocate policies that I believe are just and that will make life better for future generations. I'm open to suggestions, I'm open to being mistaken, and I'm open to considering ideas that haven't yet come up for me. I want to listen to what you have to say and respond with my honest answers and my honest opinions. I hope you'll consider me. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you everyone for being here. Uh, I'm Michael Markwick. I teach at uh, Capline University uh, in the School of Communication and there I work with the future every day. And the future that I see for all of us is beautiful. Uh, and I'm full of hope that, in fact, we can see a British Columbia that's equal to your aspirations, your best hopes for our province. I was born in a country that doesn't exist anymore. And uh, moved uh, to Canada when I was about three years old. And that's why I don't take for granted the work that you have done uh, in your association, the fact that you are here today. Uh, to make sure that we are all of us engaged in building our democracy. Uh, this could be a four-hour lecture, but it won't be. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is that in casting your, our, your ballot on May the 9th, or in one of the advanced polls, you have a power that the Queen herself does not have, which is to seat someone in the Legislative Assembly of British Columbia to represent you. The risks that our, face, that our community is facing are great. Uh, from everything from the offloading of risks uh, of a bitumen spill from the Kinder Morgan pipeline, to the Sightsee Dam and the increase in our hydro rates, to the fact that um, we still continue to have kids and youth in psychiatric distress in our community, the lack of affordable housing, and, and the, stati the statistic that actually has me motivated most these days is, is in West Vancouver Capilano. And it's the planning department in West Vancouver who pre that predicts that within the next 20 years or so, if we don't get the housing crisis corrected, the percentage of school-aged kids in our community, in my community, where we have, my wife and I raised five children in Dundrae, the percentage of school-aged kids in our community drops down to single digits. And after that, we don't have a West Vancouver anymore. So I'm so grateful that you're here with us today we have a lot of work to do uh, in the campaign, all of us together as we build a free, democratic, and inclusive British Columbia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Uh, my name is Ralph Sultan, and for the last four terms, I've been the uh, MLA for West Vancouver Capilano. And my capable assistant points me out, I am no longer the MLA for West Vancouver. Kaplan. I'm just another person seeking your support like all the other candidates here at the table on an equal basis. Um, if if re-elected, uh, that would be my fifth term. I was born and raised in East Vancouver, worked my way through UBC to an engineering degree, ended up at Harvard where I took three degrees, um, spent nine years as a professor at Harvard, 
and then another 10 years at Chief Economist at the Royal Bank. And then after several other business assignments, my wife and I ended up back in Vancouver. And then, unfortunately, she passed away. And I faced the decision of what I'd do with the rest of my life, and I chose politics. I didn't realize how complex and subtle this, uh, this game, if I could use not in the pejorative sense that word, this assignment would be. I thought, this is going to be duck soup. It's not duck soup. And I commend all of the people here on the stage who are willing to submit to the uh, time commitment, the uh, frequently unflattering reference to them, and all the other toils and tribulations that politicians put up with. I spent a lot of time uh, serving my constituents. I spent a lot of time in Victoria. And in Victoria, uh, I quickly appreciated that we have an organization with gross revenues of $50 billion easily the most complicated and largest uh, organization in the province, and very, very important, of course, to all our lives in every way. I uh, played major roles in committees looking at new legislation and in uh, responding to the criticisms of the Auditor General, who's really our internal critic, uh, about efficiency and inefficiency. At home, I've uh, taken a lot of time to work with uh, organizations such as the Lionsgate Hospital, uh, Julio Montaner's uh, HIV AIDS clinic in Vancouver, and other causes. So perhaps uh, if I have more time later, I can expand on the various uh, activities that occupy my time, but I see my time is up. Thank you very much. Thanks, um, Ralph. Uh, my name is Naomi Yamamoto. I'm the BC Liberal candidate for North Vancouver Lonsdale, which is this riding we're, we're in right now. Um, I'm a two-term MLA, and I've really enjoyed serving and working hard for the people in North Vancouver Lonsdale. Um, I've had um, five different cabinet positions. My most recent cabinet position was um, as the Minister Responsible for Emergency Preparedness. I was uh, raised in North Vancouver, went to uh, Seymour Heights Elementary School, then went to Windsor Secondary School, then uh, out to UBC. Um, on one side of the family, I'm a third generation Canadian. On the other side of my family, I'm a fourth generation Canadian. My mother's father, so my grandfather, uh, left Japan when he was, I think, 15 years old. Can you imagine? He jumped onto a freighter, went around the world a couple of times, landed in, um, uh, in Montreal. And then it took him two years to come out to BC, where I'm very glad that he uh, settled, you know, settled into. Um, I'm a previous small business owner. I've had uh, a small, my own small business, a graphic design and repro graphics company for over 20 years. Prior to that, I uh, worked uh, with our family small business, which was Japan Camera when our photo, if anybody remembers, uh, down at Capilano Mall or at Moon Valley Center. I really believe that community involvement is really important, that you can't just be um, a member of our, our great community without actually participating. So I've really been involved in uh, various uh, organizations. I was the chair of Capilano College, chair of, um, or no, on the board of the North Shore Neighborhood House, fabulous organization, they always need lots of volunteers. I um, was the chair of the uh, North End Chamber of Commerce and then chair of the BC Chamber of Commerce because of my interest in small business. I was the chair of North Shore Credit Union, and then um, I think they're now called um, Blue Shark Financial, fabulous uh, financial institution in North Vancouver. And then probably the area that I really have a lot of passion in was raising money for arts in School District 44 through the Gordon and Mary Smith Foundation Artists for Kids. I'm very thankful that my grandfather did end up in British Columbia because now BC leads the country in economic growth. I, is that a 22nd warning? Or is that the end? Sorry? That's the end. <laughs> Thank you. Hi everyone, I wish that we could have this meeting in outdoor in such a nice sunny day, but it seems that we have to stay in. Well, I'm Dr. Mehdi Russell, I'm the candidate for West Vancouver Capilano. I'm father of three um, beautiful daughters I got, and I'm here since 2008. Uh, doing my medical school, learning how to care about people, and then end up with more community-based activity, working with the homeless people, um, and then end up with disaster management in the field of Indonesia, the disaster they had in Pakistan, in Iran, 
and I spend lots of time working with different community, helping them to um, back to normal and in terms of health, getting healthier and better as before. For the last 10 years, I'm in the business of pharma and medical devices, and I'm consulting many companies on their international sales. I've been in more than 60 countries trying to get familiar with the culture at the same time doing the business and open the market for these companies that I'm working with. I see lots of issues when I'm here and I'm standing up because I'm worried about my next generation as well as the seniors. We see that as Michael said, many people now leaving West Vancouver in particular, we lost more than 2% of our population for the last five years. The crime is increasing, housing affordability, all of them now pushing people to leave West Vancouver and we have to think about it. Regardless of the party that we are running for, we have to consider the community and the community is the base of our family and our self summer that we would like to live together and be vibrant for all of us. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for inviting us here today, really appreciate it. Hi everybody, my name is Michael Charwa. I am the North Vancouver Seymour BC NDP candidate. Uh, I see very uh, a lot of familiar faces here. I, you may recognize me as the federal candidate for the New Democrats in 2008 and 2011 under Jack Layton. I also had the great pleasure of helping uh, Dr. Mehdi Russell here get started in January and February before I was uh, asked to serve as the candidate for North Vancouver Seymour. And uh, it's really great that you're here because uh, this is not really about us up here. It's all about you folks. And uh, we really appreciate you coming out here to take, to take a moment to, to talk to us and to ask us questions. I'm, uh, I'm working with, with a volunteer who has, um, who's doing it because she has a nephew who is, um, is struggling with, with disability. And there are a lot of people that are struggling and feeling that they're not getting ahead, that they're working really hard here in, uh, in North Vancouver and not getting further ahead. And we want to make sure that we let you know what our commitment is to you, that we're going to work for a more affordable British Columbia. We're going to make sure that the services that you require are there when you need it. And uh, we're going to make sure that uh, big money is taken out of, out of our politics. Um, I'm a professional actor by trade and training. I'm really happy that 97, 97 million dollars are pumped into the economy here by the film industry. And uh, we believe that it's time for a premier who's gonna stand up for everybody. It's time for an economy that works for everybody and not just Christy Clark's rich friends. And it's time to make a better BC. On May 9th, vote for Michael Charwa. Thank you so much. point out the timelines and rules for you. Uh, each question you have 33 minutes to answer for each party, so please be considerate of that. Uh, we have a sign here for when you have 30 seconds left, and uh, the bell, we will ring the bell once your time is up. And uh, any questions, concerns? Where is the um, Yes. And uh, we want to get to the issues from the beginning, so we'll just delve into specifics. Um, the first question has to do with minimum wage. Uh, what is your opinion on minimum wage standards as they stand in BC? What do you see as the pros and cons of the liberal approach of a gradual increase from 10.45 an hour in 2015 to 10.85 in 2016 versus the NDP approach of increasing the minimum wage drastically to 15? Uh, dollars an hour immediately. And this is a specific thing that uh, you can address if you want to. Uh, what do you think about the impact of large minimum wage increases to small businesses whose payments to employees will have to increase drastically and their profits might suffer as a result? And how should such businesses compensate for such a loss? Thank you. Because part of the 
estimation wasn't right. We did not suggest $15 an hour going to start immediately. We said that it's going to be within four years the first thing. We are going to gradually increase it to $15 an hour. Should I continue my three minutes? The point is that many people now in this community working hard, but they cannot um, afford a simple life. When you look at the child poverty, one of the parents working full time, still that child is in poverty. When we are looking on this, little money is going to be increased on um, minimum wages. This one is not going to be invested you know, outside the country. There, there are people working here and they would like to have a simple life many, like many other of us. And that's increasing the amount of transaction in a community and definitely helping the economy too. Then we believe that minimum wages is the minimum at least wages that people need to have to afford their life, not going to start consuming the uh, food from the food bank and you know, rather than have the ability to run a, a simple life. I talk to many people, young people who are working full time and by paying just uh, ICBC and um, the, the car allowance that they got, they can't afford even have a room <coughs> to rent. And this minimum wage is really, really uh, uh, necessary for them to um, give them a basic life. Many people not applying now, coming to North Shore to work because the minimum wage is too low. As soon as they're coming to work here in North Shore, even it's not going to cover the cost of the, the transit and, and the other cost they got to go and come and force in this area. Then minimum wage is essential need to be increased in a level, gradually, not immediately, not affecting the big small businesses also at the same time, but this one is coming in circulation and help the economy. And if I may, when, when you increase the, the amount that the poorest people have, then they don't hang on to it. They don't st stick it away in a bank account. It circulates amongst the economy. And when, uh, when money is circulating, that increases the economy. It goes from one person to another to another. If money is just socked away and saved, it doesn't, it doesn't help the economy. Uh, well, as a um, former uh, small business owner and, and uh, chair of both the North End Chamber and the BC Chamber of Commerce, minimum wage is a huge discussion uh, among the small business community. Um, I just want to maybe just put uh, some context into this. Only 5% of uh, British Columbians actually make minimum wage. Of the 5% that are making minimum wage, I think 60% live with their parents. Uh, the BC's um, youth wage and that is well over $15, actually not well over, it's over $15 an hour right now. Our focus as a BC Liberal government is actually not to create more minimum wage jobs, it's to actually keep growing the economy so that folks actually can learn and earn, um, earn more money uh, per hour, because we know that you can't raise a family on minimum wage. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tricky balance that we have to um, make sure we manage between increasing minimum wage um, uh, with some predictability but also making sure we're looking at what, um, how that will impact a majority of our small businesses in British Columbia. Thank you, Naomi. Um, of course, we are raising the minimum wage gradually, and I think the issue is not whether it should be raised or not, it's a question of how quickly. Um, right now, uh, British Columbia has about the second highest average wage in all of Canada, and we're first in Canada in economic growth. We're first in Canada in job growth, if this is so devastating, why are people coming here to fill these jobs? We have about the lowest tax environment of any province in Canada. And it isn't though we're starving the system, we have about the best health care outcomes in Canada. And the education outcomes are not just the best in Canada, on many indicators they're the best in the world. So things are going right. I think we have to be a bit careful not to be too aggressive on how rapidly we raise them in wage. But certainly, it should be increased from time to time. Thank you. Um, is it, for the room, is it your preference that we stay seated or would you like us to stand when we... Um, I think predictability is key. Um, our strategy is to support the creation of a sustainable economy for the 21st century. 
in British Columbia. And we recognize that the future of our province is, is it depends on what I'm privileged to see every day, which is what is between our ears rather than what's in a pipeline. And, and so the, uh, the BC Greens um, answer, I think, to the question is, is twofold, and perhaps my colleagues can pick this up as well as we share our time. The first is most definitely to, to invest in entrepreneurialism, because that's where our future is coming from. Our future depends on our ability to make sure that business leaders, when they get out there and take risks, are in fact supported in the risk taking that they do. We cannot have a 21st century economy without that. Furthermore, on the issue of predictability, we've had too long a history of political parties gauging the winds and deciding when it's time or opportune to raise a minimum wage. This should be as predictable as, for example, your, your tax schedule. And so the BC Greens will be developing, as government, a fair wage commission. A fair wage commission to work at arm's length from government, a fair wage commission that can hear from all of our sectors, including our small business leaders, so that the decisions that we make are always evidence-based. And, and so those are the two elements that I really would like to stress with my, with my share of our three minutes, which is that we are committed to developing a 21st century economy for British Columbia, and that the setting of, of, of uh, the, the minimum wage for our province will be something that will be handled in an apolitical way that's based on evidence. All right, well, I'm gonna start off by agreeing with Naomi here. I don't think it's possible uh, to raise a family or even to survive uh, making minimum wage. And I think that's something that we need to address. Uh, right now, BC has the second lowest minimum wage in Canada, I believe. We also have the highest cost of living in the country. Uh, and carrying on what Michael said there, I think it's absolutely essential that we do take the politics out of increasing the minimum wage. I believe everybody should make a wage that they can live off of. And that means tying the minimum wage to inflation. It means uh, tying it to cost of living. And it means trying to make sure that going forward, everybody has a wage that is livable. Uh, one of the policies that the BC Greens are also putting forward is to start a pilot project for a guaranteed income, uh, which hopefully would also go to complement the minimum wage. Thank you. This isn't just a theoretical discussion. This could be me or you or anybody else that just happens to lose their job, and all of a sudden they've got to go up and find a new one. And maybe it's going to be at minimum wage, which is something like $10.85 an hour, which is very, very little money. People say, oh, well, let's raise it up to $15 an hour. And then people that look at it say, well, a minimum livable wage in Metro Vancouver is $20 an hour. Exactly. So this is a long exactly. wage. Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So does the red card mean time up? At least 30 oh, seconds left. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to point out that if you do have any questions, uh, our colleague Ardalon can pass around the little um, cards where you can write your questions and submit them. Uh, so the next question has to do with health care. Um, as you know, health care remains the single, single largest item in the budget, projected to account for 41% of all government spending in 2017-2018. Uh, according to the Ministry of Health. At the same time, the province is also currently facing a shortage of family care physicians. How should these issues be regulated in terms of the health care budget? just speak very briefly on this. I think healthcare is a right, and I think everybody uh, in BC should have access to the best possible healthcare. Uh, I think we've seen uh, good investments in building hospitals. Uh, I think we need to see more investment in the staff inside the hospitals and in programs inside those hospitals that provide better healthcare to everybody. Um, I'd note a couple of things. Uh, First on the ground in, in my community, uh, in, uh, at the West Vancouver Senior Center, we had a community conversation exactly about this question. And uh, a lot of the seniors, of course, had their own physicians, but their kids don't. 
And so the premise of the question is correct. Uh, one of the problems that uh, we have is with the way that uh, our post-secondary education system has been constructed over the past 16 years, where so much of uh, it is now shifted to a cost recovery basis. So it's very difficult, unless you come from a wealthy family or are tolerant of high, of high debt, to actually consider a career in medicine. I know that one of our daughters, who could be a fantastic physician, has that concern. And so one of the problems with the supply of GPs is, in fact, the difficulty they have in getting through med school. Uh, back to the conversation at the West Vancouver Senior Center, when you see the rate of traffic that we're faced with even today, it's difficult for people to be assured that they can get the care they need when they need it. And so one of the ideas that came out of our community conversation uh, at the Senior Center was to support the creation of an urgent care center for West Vancouver, uh, modeled on the urgent care center at UBC. So it wouldn't duplicate the work that Lionsgate Hospital ER does, but it could definitely supplement and allow uh, seniors and others to get the care they need when they need it. Uh, so I think you have to take these things together. Uh, we're looking at an aging population. Uh, we're looking at a population where um, uh, uh, we don't all of us have access to phys physicians when we need them. And we're looking at a system where, with great respect to my outstanding GP, the time that you get with your GP is, is rationed. And so one of the things that we would actually support is med students who do not want to be on a fee-for-service basis. Medical students who want to graduate, be doctors, and be on a salary. And, and so if you can get more physicians like those into community clinics, supported by um, nurse practitioners, supported by uh, uh, psychiatric nurses, and so on, I think we can actually see growing in our own neighborhoods the kinds of on-the-ground support that uh, our communities need when they need them. Thank you. Well, I think we all agree that uh, nothing really is more fundamental than the services you expect from government uh, is health care. And there's also, I think, lots of evidence that we are scrambling to fill the uh, general practitioner uh, slots that are in demand. One of the reasons we're scrambling, however, is it takes a long time to train a physician. And many of you perhaps aren't aware that during the 1990s, the NDP was in power and they were suffering from lower tax income, even though the taxes were very high. And they decided to cut back in areas of spending, including health care. And they noticed that the more doctors there were, the more the health budget seemed to be going up. Therefore, the way to cut down health spending was to cut down the number of doctors. So believe it or not, they drastically slashed the number of doctors in our medical schools. And we're still playing catch up. And it was quite consistent with the corollary, which was not to build any hospitals. In 10 years, during the 90s, the NDP didn't build a single hospital. So we played catch up for the last 15 years. I think we're doing quite well, but no doubt there's still more to be done. Thanks, Ralph. And, and just to follow along that, um, we um, have more than doubled our um, budget to healthcare since uh, 2001, but we know that the population hasn't doubled. Uh, but there are a lot more seniors um, and, and people living longer, so obviously a need for, um, for uh, more um, services. But regardless of how much money we spend, if you look at our health outcomes, our health outcomes, health outcomes are one of the best in Canada. We have the highest longevity. People live uh, longer in British Columbia than anywhere else in BC. We have the best outcomes, survivor, cancer survival outcomes in Canada. And that goes the same with the with heart disease. If you have heart disease in um, in British Columbia, your health outcome is going to be the best in in, uh, in Canada. I'm particularly proud of, and I know um, uh, Ralph is as well, of the investment that uh, the community made in terms of the foundation raising money, but also government investment in the Hope Center. One of the um, issues that has really come to uh, the top is um, our the resources that we put into mental health. And I can tell you that all four North Shore MLAs um, fought uh, voraciously for the new uh, Hope Center Mental Health um, Facility. If we haven't been there, that's a great investment and that's something that we're extremely proud of in, in North Vancouver. Healthcare, new Democrats, you're welcome. We invented the healthcare system in this country and we're the only ones who can be trusted to make sure that it's there for you when you need it. You know, of course, we are terribly worried about two-tier two healthcare, like places such as the Canby Surgical Center. And we believe vehemently that healthcare needs to be there when you need it. 
And, uh, you know, it's a cultural thing. We're a little smug here in Canada. We look down to the south and we say, you know, get your act together, you guys, because it is a fundamental human right to have health care when you need it. And uh, one of the things that we're going to work towards is uh, community health centers, where you get primary health care with, with a team of, 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 of doctors and uh, practical nurses. But, and uh, we've got to make sure that get, we get people off of wait, uh, waiting lists as well. And that's another, another thing that we're going to be working with. And now, somebody who really knows things, Dr. Mehdi Russell. Thanks very much. As a person who worked in healthcare system in many countries, I say it's not an easy issue to tackle. And always governments got the issue with the healthcare. That's number one. But there are ways to resolve the issue. And one of the promises that Christy Clark made on the last government was everyone going to have a family physician. Now today that we are now talking with each other, over 700,000 people has no family physician and we are in a shortage. And they are the people who can make our healthcare cost-benefit, try to resolve many issues in first time before the patients get into the hospital. The other issue with the hospitals right now is that they are arranged performance based means that soon after you're getting the patient in and then at the same time, going to um, release the patient without even caring what's happening at the end, you know, in the society and then in the community, you get more uh, budget. And as a result, now patients release and, and uh, get admission again in a hospital. And it's not the efficient way to run a hospital. That's not the issue. I can say that we are not hearing from liberals what's the need and what's the demand. And then we say we put that much money in our healthcare, and how we smart can manage a healthcare that everyone can get the services they that deserve. That's the issue that we have to talk about and resolve the issue rather than blaming you know each other about the, the healthcare system. Healthcare system is essential; it's a government job. It needs to provide it to everyone at the time that they need. And there is a way using the same budget to run a better healthcare system in Canada. professionals who would benefit from the LNG project um, and uh, ensure the proper pr preservation of BC's valuable environmental assets and resources at the same time. So basically the pros and cons of the LNG oil and gas development in BC. Um, if we could uh, start from the other side of the side, that would be great. Uh, very briefly, uh, we have to remember that it's it's liquefied fracked gas, and fracking is a it's a really destructive, uh, a really destructive process. Plus, they don't even tell us what chemicals are pumped into the ground. Aquifers are are being uh, they're being poisoned, and the hundred thousand jobs are are not have not materialized. There's only one job, and it's uh, six hundred dollars a day for. A, a BC liberal to go around and talk about the, the fantasy of, of liquefied fracked gas. And uh, we believe, though, that it is possible to have good paying jobs, economic growth, that also, that also um, protects the environment. And that's why we're vehemently opposed to, to the Kinder Morgan pipeline, because it's just not worth the risk. There's uh, just a, a, a few jobs once it's created. And uh, the, the prevailing winds come from the east. The uh, distillates are, are poisonous. Uh, it's going to impact not only tourism jobs, but also <coughs> jobs in my industry, film and television. So you know, we do believe that it's possible to have economic growth and a sustainable environment. But uh, you know, Kinder Morgan is definitely not the way to go. And Dr. Russell has some things to say about 
Well, um, I think the liberals need to answer this question. The biggest investment they promised in last term was on LNG, and they promised to open at least three sites and you know bringing hundred thousand jobs. They have to answer what's happened. I think that even not a single uh, site and plant is operating now, and zero jobs created for the LNG. And the biggest project they promised is now failed. And by decreasing the tax for the small businesses. Now we try to bring more small businesses um, in economy and help them to uh, help the, the whole BC have a more vibrant, more um, strong economy. Then we decrease the tax by 0.5% for the small businesses. Uh, thank you. So uh, we, have, we had a, uh, a great vision continue to support the vision for LNG in BC. Um, just so to put it into context, there are currently about 20 projects um, on the go right now in various stages of development. Uh, we have um, wood fiber LNG that has uh, decided to move forward with construction. Uh, that's about a, a $1.7 billion project. And that'll create uh, 650 jobs. You spoke to the jobs. Um, and we do know that we're going to need the expertise and the skills from uh, those folks from uh, Iran uh, with those, um, those skills to help us fill those jobs. And I know that we will continue to work with APEG BC, the Association of Professional Engineers and Geophysicists, to ensure that um, um, the, the um, uh, work, the expertise that um, folks have, whether it's in Iran or other countries that they bring here, um, is, are recognized and so that there, we can maximize the employment and potential of uh, uh, immigrants. And um, just to let you know, there has been about $20 billion of investment so far in um, um, working to prepare for the LNG economy. And that's um, really uh, helped a lot of uh, communities uh, in British Columbia that needed that boost, especially Aboriginal communities. I'll let Ralph speak to more about LNG. Well, uh, on this in very important issue, particularly for uh, professionals coming from Iran, a very sophisticated education system, very highly trained people, very much used to the oil and gas industry, uh, they are much needed. And Naomi's correct, frequently APEC BC, the association I have to be a member of as well as a professional engineer, um, takes a somewhat cautious approach to credentialing and issuing certificates. but. The uh, whole profession in its entirety is growing at a very astounding rate of 4% a year here in British Columbia. And I would think about half of those are people trained abroad. So it isn't as though APEC BC isn't actively in the credentialing business. As Naomi also said, the, um, and as I would observe, the uh, NDP policy platform, which came out a couple of days ago, was in error when it said there are no LNG plants uh, being built. Uh, the Tilbury plant on the Fraser River is a $400 million investment. As far as I know, it's almost ready to start shipping. This isn't sort of a pie in the sky project. The other projects obviously are subject to world conditions. I think though, uh, environmentally, I sure would rather have a natural gas pipeline going through my backyard than one carrying heavy oil. Thank you. Okay, I don't want to write it down. Okay, uh, so just very quickly, uh, with the indulgence of the moderator uh, on the healthcare question, just to clarify here, it's an occupational hazard, uh, professor, that kind of thing. So, uh, Gordon Campbell, two point four million dollars at sort of two point four percent annual increase in real per capita GDP spending. For healthcare, 2.4 percent. Under Christy Clark, it's fallen by 0.3 percent on her watch. Um, as to the issue of LNG, and I'd rather have no pipeline uh, going through my backyard. Um, and in fact, uh, if, if Oxford University is to be believed, it's the Smith School for Sustainable Finance. Um, L the, the discussion about LNG being a transitional energy uh, on the findings of the Oxford Smith School is. Um, uh, not necessary because the change that they're predicting within four years that is in the life of the legislature we are going to elect on May 9th. They're predicting not a, uh, a gradual evolutionary shift to sustainable energy technologies, but this is their word, a revolutionary shift. 
to sustainable energy technology. So what this means for engineers is an unprecedented opportunity to be the architects of a new energy infrastructure for British Columbia, for Canada. We're seeing the transition away from fossil fuels to intelligent energy. And, and there's, there, if you thought, and I'm, I'm a communication professor, so you would think that I would think that the internet is the thing. The internet was revolutionary, but it is nothing in comparison, nothing in comparison to the revolution that's coming globally when it comes to energy innovation. And so, uh, in a very concrete way, what the Green Party would do uh, in British Columbia is we would, we would invest $20 million a year for innovation so that we can actually help engineers mentor and develop the technologies that we need in order for British Columbia to be a global leader in sustainable energy. Each job, there have been 100 jobs created out of wood fiber LNG. Each job has come with a $440,000 subsidy. $440,000 subsidy from taxpayers. We can't sustain that burn rate, especially for a, an energy sector that is not sustainable and doesn't have a future. All right, I'll try and get through this quickly here. Uh, I'm very happy that the BC Green Party opposes all LNG projects as a matter of principle. Uh, there's a huge uh, basis of evidence for that. Uh, first of all, is the increase in emissions. Uh, wood fiber, or no, sorry, Pacific Northwest LNG alone, one plant would account for a 20% increase in BC's emissions, which is the opposite direction we want to be going in. Uh, fracking has caused over a thousand earthquakes in northern BC since it started. Uh, there's the risk of tankers on our coast. And there's also a bad economic case for LNG. Uh, like Michael said, each job at the Pacific Northwest plant is being subsidized by the government. And other than that plant, there aren't a lot of people who are willing to invest in LNG because it's not profitable for the corporations to do so in the global market. Chair Kay to uh, mention something. So. Hello again, my name is Kay, Civic Chair, and I would like to thank you, all of you, for being here, and all our, all our guests for um, encouraging the people to participate in a democratic life. Also, I want to announce that uh, Civic IC has performed the translation of a book as the Citizenship Handbook. And these describe all the uh, political process in Canada that would be good things for a start, being more knowledgeable about how the party is working, how the bills in parliament working, how are the differential parts of our judiciary, legislature, and executive uh, uh, system. Uh, this book is over there. You can get there. This is uh, free of charge. But if you like, you can donate something for uh, covering some of our costs. So we would appreciate if you look at that, and later you will put uh, send your comment for us. The name is uh, Citizenship Handbook. Uh, this is uh, actually fourth or fifth version of the different citizenship ha handbook in Chinese, in Vietnamese, in uh, and in uh, other language, and now. We have the Farsi uh, Citizenship Handbook too. That is the Rahnamai Hukwe Shahrabi. Thank you very much. 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 And you may have break, a break, and after we may continue discussion. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon, and welcome to the second part of our program. My name is Ahar Janov. I'm one of the directors with Civic IC, and I'll be with you for this portion of the questions. So candidates, we've gathered some questions from the audience, and audience, thank you so much for providing us with your questions. What we have tried to do 
is compile as many questions together as possible. We probably will have time for only three questions to go around. And if you've had a question that you've given us that was directed to a particular candidate, with our apologies, because we do want to hear from everyone when they answer, we have not been able to ask those questions, but I'm sure the candidates will be around at the end and they'll be happy to speak with you individually and answer the questions. So candidates, the same rules apply as in the first half of the program. Each party will have three minutes. You may choose to decide that, uh, divide that as you decide between your party members. The first question is, if elected, what would your party do to support the most vulnerable in our society, uh, those receiving disability and social assistance, and how does the promises your party makes about spending affect our taxes and services? So we'll start with the Liberal Party first this time. Absolutely. Sure. So the question again is, if elected, what would your party do to support the most vulnerable in our society, specifically those receiving social assistance and disability, as disability social assistance rates have not increased in the last 10 years, and how does the promises your party makes about spending affect our taxes and services? Great, thank you. And I think the program that uh, the BC Liberals is most proud of is the Single Parent Employment Initiative. We call it the SPEED program. So a lot of people say, um, probably rightly so, why can't people just get a job? Why can't you just get a job? Well, you know what, if you're a single parent, uh, you've got kids, um, and maybe your education isn't quite up to um, snuff, and you need to be, you need to go back, and you're on, so go back to school, and you're on social assistance or welfare. What we did in the past, we actually, then said, that's great, you went back to school, but you're no longer eligible to receive social assistance. So what we said is, let's, let's make sure these single parents actually have the opportunity to go back to school. So we said, we will pay for your education for up to a year in an area where we know that um, there is a job for you waiting. And then, we've, we, then we thought, you know what, that's great, but who's gonna look after the kids? So we're gonna look after those kids. We're gonna pay for childcare for those single parents who are going back to school. And then, you know what, it's kind of difficult for them to get to school if they don't have a vehicle. So we said, while you're going to school, we will pay for the cost of transportation to, to, your, to, uh, to the school. And we thought, you know, maybe there'll be a couple thousand uh, folks um, on income assistance and welfare that'll take advantage of this. We've had over 4,600 uh, people apply for this program. They're in the program. And, um, and we've had now a thousand people, I don't want to say graduate, but you know, go through the program and they're getting jobs and they're full-time jobs. And I think when you think about some of the good stuff, these are target investments to lift people and families out of income. And I can tell you that folks who have gone through the program, mostly women, about 80%, 90% women, they have said the best feeling is when their children see them working. And that's one way, and I think a really good way that we have broken the poverty cycle. As Naomi said, uh, the bottom line is the best form of social assistance is a job, and training people to, to, to be able to hold down a job uh, is certainly, I think, priority one. But there are many people, as the question implies, who cannot really even qualify for a job because of disability, perhaps uh, mental issues or whatever. Um, just a couple of thoughts. First of all, what is the impact on the tax system? Well, it's interesting somebody was smart enough to link those two questions because they would seldom be linked. The answer is we spend, any government of British Columbia spends a huge amount of money looking after those who are less able to look after themselves. Order of magnitude, the Ministry of Children and Families, as I recall, correct me if I'm wrong, Naomi, we're talking about an annual budget that's uh, beginning to approach $2 billion. Well, if you think of the entire K-12 education system, you're getting up into that size range. So it's easy to spend money in vast quantities and we have to be prudent.
as Rel mentioned, there are people with disabilities, so it's not just as simple as saying, well, um, instead of just get a job, well, let's get, a, get them to get an education, and then they can get a job. There are people who are in poverty in this province. It is inexcusable, it is irresponsible, and it's been going on for too long. It's a thing that we need to fix and not just talk about. Um, one of the platform strategies for the BC Green Party, you can see it on our website, is about income security, a strategy for covering the basics. To address and alleviate poverty by addressing income and food security and the need for affordable housing. It's a package deal, it needs to be fixed. Is it gonna cost money? Yes it is, but that's money well spent. And people have looked at this say, we spend so much money in piecemeal programs trying to help them here, there, and everywhere, that if we took all that money and provided a basic livable income and support for people with disabilities, in the end, we would actually save money. Simple as that. Thank you. Yeah, and I think there are a huge amount of things that we could do to help uh, support our most vulnerable. Uh, I would definitely agree with Richard that the guaranteed income is hopefully going to make huge strides in reducing poverty and providing everybody with an equal footing. And one part of that that I think is really important is uh, a guaranteed income that will also be provided uh, to children in care who are phasing out of care from ages 19 to 24. Uh, which is an issue that's been ignored uh, for a very long time, and I think that's something that we have to really take action on. Uh, we also have the highest child poverty rate in the country still, uh, and to address that, we've proposed uh, to put in place free child care for children under three, free early childhood education for children three to four. Uh, we also support providing breakfast for kids in low-income areas when they go to school so that they can have something to eat. Uh, just quickly on the taxes, I think uh, we're trying to put in place a more sensible approach to taxes uh, where the money we collect is used for the reasons we're collecting the tax. So our carbon tax plan, we're going to increase the carbon tax, but we're going to use the money we make from the carbon tax to build renewable energy, to build transit. I'm going to pass it on. Uh, just to answer the question uh, with a quick story, a friend of mine was uh, trafficked into prostitution when she was in foster care on the watch of the BC NDP government. And under the watch of the BC Liberal government, she's a single mom, her situation got worse and worse and worse. Uh, with great respect, what we've seen uh, is uh, the erosion of support for families like hers. Uh, one quick um, item, uh, the Adult Basic Education Program at CAF, which was supposed to be in her lifeline. It was, she's one of the most intelligent, articulate people I know, dropped 54% in the past year or so. So the top 2% and uh, Christy Clark's big money donors might be doing really well, but it's, it seems to me that it's on the backs of the most vulnerable, particularly people with disabilities. There hasn't been an increase for a decade while the, the, price, the cost of living has gone up and up and up. Three things that we will immediately do upon gaining government is we will increase the rates for disability by, uh, by $100 a, a month. And that's not a lot, but at least it's something immediately that we can do to alleviate the poverty of people with disabilities. Plus, we're, we're going to stop the clawback of the bus pass. It, that was just a heartless thing. Here, we're going to increase, oh no, we're going to take back the bus pass. That was just heartless. Plus, when people actually get a job, and you know, they should be rewarded for that, and we're gonna let them keep $200 instead of once again clawing it back from them. Many people coming here highly educated and we put them in poverty as well. We don't need to go and you know, educating people who are uh, in poverty and put them in, in place to work. You need at least first taking care of the immigrants coming here and you put lots of barriers for their credential and they decide even to go back, or if they stay here, the kids getting in poverty and the families getting in poverty. And we see nothing from liberals in that sense. Regarding to the tax, I'm referring you to independent reviewers who review the platform by NDP. Paying these monies that we and, and my colleagues, uh, Michael, mentioned is not going to affect the tax, we're just changing the priorities. 
by simple changing the priorities you see, much more welfare for the people disadvantaged and they're now going to pay extra taxes. Thank you. So the second question is a two-part question going from generals to specifics. First part of the question is, please tell us about the plans that your party has with regards to assisting small, supporting small business and creating jobs. And within that answer, if you could actually please try to make uh, some specific comments with respect to the issues that new immigrants are facing when they come here and they're highly educated oftentimes and they cannot get the credentials to get their licenses and work in their own fields. We're gonna start with the Green Party. Thank you very much. I'd like to take the second question first and then um, perhaps my colleagues can take on the piece about the strategic, our strategy for the emerging economy. Um, I had the privilege of, of graduating from the, the University of Toronto with a degree in philosophy. That was a great honor to have it. And landing my dream job, which was at the Ontario Human Rights Commission. Um, I was Rosemary Brown's chief of staff um, at the OHRC. Um, I'm, it, I think it's shameful that British Columbia does not have a human rights commission. The BC Liberals cut it. Um, at the very beginning of their term uh, about 16 years ago. Um, in order for us to have an economy, a society that welcomes um, people from every culture, every race, every religion, every background, we must have a, a human rights commission in British Columbia to make sure that our communities are inclusive, that everyone feels a part of building the future of this province and no one is discriminated against. That's the Rosemary Brown to me coming up. So, uh, um, no, would either of you like to take the piece about the sustainable economy? Okay, so, um, so in terms of, of uh, innovation, uh, I believe that was the question. Uh, what we would do, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, we would have um, uh, a line item in a BC Green budget to support innovation, to support risk taking. Um, I'd like to see that translate into our urban geography so that, um, as you know, uh, commercial real estate, real estate as such, is unaffordable. Uh, and, and so what we would want to see is strategies that would actually allow uh, 21st century businesses to get going uh, in our communities, uh, that entrepreneurs are supported in the risk taking that they do, uh, and that uh, we recognize that, again, the future of our province is in the, um, uh, the innovation of our people rather than in an LNG uh, pipeline or a bitumen pipeline. So the BC Green Party would then uh, support innovation in this way uh, by, by striking an, emer an emerging economy task force. We want to see the province and, and, and public policy in the province based on evidence. For too long, what we've seen instead, as you, have you, as you no doubt seen yourselves, is that the politics of the province are being called uh, by the people who are writing the biggest checks, the biggest corporations writing the biggest checks, the biggest unions writing the biggest checks. So we want instead to build a government of British Columbia that is innovative and sustainable and driven by British Columbians. And that includes innovation um, in terms of um, the 21st century we, con we want to build and anti-discrimination in, in, in British Columbia where we are leaders once again in, the ad in advocating a fair and impartial defense of our human rights. I've got three pages of notes. I'm just trying to figure out what's the best thing to tell you guys. Um, a, a revamp, sorry, we out of time? Okay, thank you. Thanks, um, a couple of years ago, um, before I got the, uh, the position as the Minister Responsible for Emergency Preparedness, the Premier made, um, um, appointed me to Cabinet as the Minister Responsible for Small Business and Tourism, which is, was perfect right up my alley, and um, I, um, I certainly got to talk to a lot of people. One of the things we did was um, I chaired a um, small business roundtable, and uh, this was a, a Premier Small Business Roundtable, where we got the advice and, and um, insight of small businesses to government policies. So I just wanted to let you know that, um, you know, of the, I don't know how many um, businesses we have in British Columbia, over 400,000 or, or close to 400,000 are small businesses. How we define small business is any company that has 50 or fewer employees. 
But I can tell you as a small business owner with maybe at the most five or six employees and, and oftentimes just a couple, a business that had 10 employees seemed like a larger business to me. But if you look at those um, small businesses, the um, almost 400,000, um, the vast majority, maybe over 80, 86%, actually have five or fewer business uh, people working for them. That's the true picture of small businesses in BC. So what have they told us? They said that um, we want to make it easier for them to do business. In other words, cut unnecessary red tape and regulations. We lead the country in doing that. CFIB gave us an A grade for I don't know how many years in a row now. Other jurisdictions look to us for that leadership. Um, they also, small businesses also um, have asked us to um, look at our small business tax rate. So our, our 2017 budget um, commitment has said that um, we would lower the, the small business tax from 2.5% to uh, I think 2%. That'll be the second lowest in the country. That'll be good for, for small businesses. Um, if you look at a lot of small businesses work in the film industry on the North Shore, huge film industry, and uh, we will sustain that, those tax credits that um, create so many jobs, especially for you, Michael. Um, but with respect to the new, um, the new businesses innovation, our BC tech strategy is second to none. We just launched it a couple of months ago, and talk about excitement in the tech industry, most of them small businesses, and attracting people here from other countries, especially what's happening down south. They're looking to BC to, to relocate. And um, we've um, uh, certainly uh, want to create an environment where it's easy to do business, that government does not get in the way. And the other thing that small businesses have said to us, look at, with respect to minimum wage, make sure it's balanced and um, that um, incremental increases are predictable. And uh, those are the things that small businesses are saying. Have I got, have I got 20 seconds? Okay, my friends on the left uh, didn't mind departing off script by uh, belaboring big, uh, big money in politics. I have a, a flash card to hold up here. $672,576. This is described as the largest contribution in BC provincial history. This is history making. It was a donation to the BC NDP party from the steelworkers. So how about that? Talk about big money in politics. They set the record. Congratulations. I work for a living. If I don't work, I don't get paid. So I'm not going to apologize for taking, taking uh, the help of other working people. For, for making a living. Both Dr. Russell and I are, are self-employed contractors. We're business people ourselves. And we know that the small business are the backbone of the economy. And we would much rather have uh, the support of, uh, and be supportive of small business than huge multinational corporations that take their money out of our jurisdictions. Because small businesses, when, when you buy local, the money is circulated here. And it stays here where the people are working. So to that, we will be uh, supporting a drop in the small business tax rate to 2%, which makes us on par with Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba, our other Western, Western people. Uh, zero. All right. And uh, we want to make sure that, uh, that as far as, uh, as supporting uh, our, our, uh, our, our Iranian, Canadian folks, that uh, free ESL classes are important. And I'm going to let Dr. Russell talk to about credentials because that is his particular uh, forte. Well, uh, I already talked about the credentials and many people coming in hope to have a small business, but they're facing many issues to uh, have the credentials and start working here. And the goals done nothing for the last 16 years about them. And it's simply they don't care about you know, the people they want to be here and as immigrants. Um, going on small businesses, we see hundreds of mill workshops and factories closed as small businesses simply because we see not a appropriate action by liberals to save the railroads, not going you know, without any process and we would like to have more engineered food before we export them. Uh, increasing more jobs as a small businesses by construction on infrastructure, we promise 100,000 jobs when we are going to have more construction for affordable housing and for the roads and, and the um, whole uh, infrastructure we are planning to have development during the next 10 years. 
Um, as Michael said, cutting the tax of small businesses to 2% is the other uh, policy by the BCNDP and we are, as a small business people, know how to care about the other business people who are also got a small business and not the corporate with huge amount of money in their hands. Thank you. Oh, and here. Yeah. Well, I still have 10 seconds. We are going to make sure that, uh, that foreign credentials are recognized uh, more more vigorously because it's not fair that we entice people to come to Canada and, and they're they're well educated they're they're bright and then they end up being taxi drivers that's just not right and big money out of the politics so the next question is what is your party's plan for stopping the increase of the price of housing in Metro Vancouver? First. <laughs> it's often thought of as being a supply and demand situation, so we're going to work on the supply side of it. We're going to create 114,000 new housing units. And by the, by, that also helps us to, uh, to create jobs as well, because you know we need jobs, we need uh, uh, skilled laborers to put those houses together. So that is the largest and the biggest plank for us wanting to deal with this terrible housing situation that we're in. Homeowners, they get a homeowner's grant and we feel that renters should get a renter's grant as well. So we have a $400 a year uh, rent grant that we're going to give people who, who are renting. Also, we've got to tighten up the landlord and tenancy agreement so that rent evictions and, uh, and this, this bizarre concept of, of the average rent, rental rate for the neighborhood uh, allows landlords to jack up the price, that's got to be stopped as well. Money laundry and look at the properties here as a kind of investment for foreigners the other issue that increased the price and we see the very late action by liberals for the last two years to stop it and not allowing the foreigners coming and buy the properties and live and the other programs that we are going to promote is taxing the houses getting empty and people who are living here not paying taxes just buying the property for the investment to control the, the price. Well, it's obviously a very, very complex subject, and you're seeing a thorough airing of the issues in the media. I would like to suggest what you should not do. What you should not do, like the NDP uh, has done, is publish a platform promising 114,000 new housing units, which, let's say, would cost maybe 200,000 each for a $22 billion commitment over 10 years, or let's say $2.3 dollars a year and not mention it in the write-up. How in the heck did this thing pass the editors? They just sort of slip by. It's a huge hole in their platform. Maybe it's a good idea, but they should explain where the 2.3 billion dollars additional is going to come from. Fully costed. And then turning to my friends on the right here, and Michael, get ready. Uh, what you should not do, what you should not do is buy into Mr. Weaver's plan particularly sensitive to those here on the North Shore. I figured if my son, who lives in Seattle, wanted to come up here and buy a house and live closer to me um, at uh, a fairly expensive level, shall we say, as a foreign purchaser, he'd pay 30%, and then he'd pay 12% on top of that as part of the property transfer tax, a total of 42%. So whoever was selling that house to him would pay almost half of the money to Mr. Weaver. What a great plan for solving the housing problem here on the North Shore. Over to you, Michael. Thank you so much, Ralph. Uh, is everyone having fun? <laughs> uh, so um, what, we, what we have seen is that, in fact, um, we, um, the, the number of uh, youth in our homeless shelter on the North Shore, just down the street, um, uh, is increasing. 
the number of seniors in our homeless shelter is increasing. I've had conversations with some of our most innovative, we know, uh, one of our most innovative developers of, of seniors housing, and he's saying that as, as long as land prices remain as they are, forget his uh, ability as an innovative, sustainable uh, developer of seniors housing to do anything in the Lower Mainland. So the, the situation is getting worse and worse and worse. Um, and our focus, and I'm gonna hand it off to my colleagues in a second if you don't mind, uh, is, is to make sure that if you pay your income taxes in British Columbia, if you pay your income taxes in Canada, then, then you will receive the same treatment as anyone living in this, in this uh, uh, province. What I have seen from, from my friends in real estate is that when uh, Christy Clark recklessly introduced her foreign buyers tax, the number of sales in, uh, in our community plummeted in August uh, 2016 to eight. When the global economy died in 2008, 34 houses were sold in West Vancouver. So what we want to see is greater predictability and making sure there's affordable housing. How did we get here? How did we get to a place where houses aren't homes for families, but they are commodities to be bought and sold, and their only value is how much money you can get for them? How did we even get here? And do we want to be here? And now that we're here, do we want to stay there? Um, it means that people can't afford to live in our city. And if people can't live here, there's not going to be much city left. We have to do something about this. The, the Green Party, it's not Mr. Weaver's plan, it's the BC Greens, are going forward with an affordable homes strategy. Three simple points to work towards this overheated market so that it's not uh, unaffordable to live in the city, to promote affordable housing, and to protect renters. Three simple things that need to be done and perhaps should have been done a long time ago. I was raised in North Vancouver. I've lived here pretty well my entire life. And looking at the housing market right now for purchasing houses and for renting houses, nobody I went to high school with at Argyle in West, or sorry, at Argyle and Lynn Valley will ever be able to afford to live in North Vancouver. It, it's simply not possible. And we have to take action to address that. Thanks for your questions. Please feel free to have a look. Get informed. Make an informed decision. Encourage people to get out and vote. This is a democracy. 40% of people in this province don't vote. And if they did, they could form government. It's that big a block of people. So talk to your friends. It's not that difficult. Organizations like this, the newspapers, make every effort to make sure that you can hear from all of the different parties. And thank goodness there's a choice. Thank you. I have to strongly agree with Richard there on the importance of voting. I, I think it's absolutely unacceptable uh, that not everybody goes out and gets involved and votes. That's what democracy is and that's what we have to stand for and that's why I'm here. I'm here uh, to say what I believe in and to present my ideas, and I think everybody else on the stage is here to do the same. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. I had a good time, and I'm looking forward to more lively debates as the election goes on. So I, I'm too fidgety to sit any longer. So uh, uh, this is a legacy election. The choice before voters in British Columbia today is um, a, a, a choice to make history. For the first time, what we see um, in this campaign is a party that's funded solely by British Columbians, by individual donations only. That's the BC Green Party. We're not waiting for the RCMP and the special prosecutor appointed by the criminal investigation branch to get to the bottom of what's happened in terms of the contribution scandal. Uh, we are, and we're not waiting until after the, um, the writ is, is resolved on May the 10th. We're at work right now to build a new politics for British Columbia that's funded solely by British Columbians. 
So it is so important, and I'm so grateful to you for organizing this event, because it's, it's only through us that we can renew our democracy. And our democracy is renewed exactly like this, with people from various political beliefs, various backgrounds, places of origin, coming together and focusing on the common good. But just to bang that drum again, the work of identifying the common good must be done on our own terms without looking over our shoulders to union or corporate paymasters. So thank you, I'm deeply grateful to you for this opportunity. Thank you, Michael. Perhaps it's appropriate that the oldest guy on the stage here commends the youngest person on the stage. Because in many ways, uh, I'm sure Christy wouldn't like me to hear, hear me say this, but I think the Green Party um, has a future permanently. I wish I could say as much about our friends on the left here. Uh, you know, many of you are too young to have been around and witnessed the decade of the 90s. Uh, they had 10 years to run this place and they did their best. Um, uh, at the end of that time, there was a ballot. How are we doing? Do you know what the result was? Uh, 77 people's, 77 votes, I guess the best way to put it, said, terrible be gone. And in favor, they had two votes. That was the composition of the legislature I, in, I entered for the first time after 10 years of NDP rule. Be careful what you wish, wish for. 50,000 people a year leaving this province. Five or six successive credit downgrade, downgrades. Not enough money to keep the universities operating properly. Not uh, adequately building new hospitals. The list goes on. Please, You're please. Thank you, Russ. And uh, uh, I too wish uh, all the best. I, d I don't know um, Michael very well, but Joshua and Richard, um, all the best in a, in a campaign, uh, in your campaigns. Uh, the BC Liberal platform is 130 pages. You can download it or read it online. But to put it in a nutshell, I, I believe strongly we're the only party that's going to be controlling spending, uh, keeping taxes low, and ensuring that jobs are created um, in British Columbia. Um, I believe our platform is positive. Um, we've got a great attitude. We believe in the future, and also in, in the belief of the next generation, your kids or grandchildren, to ensure that they don't, they don't inherit a huge debt that we know the other two platforms uh, could burden them with um, as they age and their children's uh, children um, are raised on the North Shore. Thanks very much again to everyone um, who came and showed how important is the election to them. Uh, it's a historical day for me too because we got the youngest and the oldest on this table as a uh, candidate for provincial election. I need also to thank Ralph serving his life for the community and, and working hard for all of us. And yeah, We need to remind liberals that for 16 years also they forget <coughs> our communities and our people. And it's not a good result if you look at the result at the end of the day that the homelessness increased by 30% according to your own statistics. It's not a good result when affordability gets the least in this area. It's not a good result that in your constituency 2%, more than 2% of the people left the community. It's not a good result that nine out of 10 senior houses underfunded, and seniors and kids and schools and you, in fact, done lots of good to the community and the society that we are living in. We might do well individually, but our community is not vibrant, and peoples are suffering every single day. Thank you. Ralph talks about the past, but we want to talk about the future. We want to make sure that you have a more affordable life. We want to make sure that the services are there for you when you need them. And we want to make sure that there's an economy that works for everybody and not just Christy Clark's rich friends. We're going to make sure that big money gets taken out of politics. And we're going to campaign for a proportional representation so these poor Greens, they don't have to have that horrible choice of parking their vote with, say, us, the New Democrats, to get rid of Christy Clark, or, and, or, or just wasting their vote. Every vote should count. 
And we're going to make sure that that happens when we form government. And please vote for the new Democrats. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming out. We really appreciate it. Yes, you only only three or four minutes of your time. I just wanted to again thank uh, our supporters, uh, the Canadian Iranian Foundation, Canadian Educators Association, Society of Iranian Canadian Professionals, Greater Vancouver Counseling and Education Society for Families. Tri-City Chinese Canadian Association, ARIA TV, and Hamiri Media. If there are any representatives left from those organizations, it would be great if you could come to the front and we could just uh, thank you all together. And uh, we also have uh, the two business sponsored inve uh, no, sponsors, Investors Group, and uh, Descartes Jewelry. Yes. Um, so yes, uh, anybody would like to come to the front? Uh, I know the CIF and CCAP are here, and the uh, Counseling and Education Society. Uh, just it's not bad to see how the other people uh, supported the team, and also they did it as a kind of operation. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is one of the way that we are doing in this community in the next future because there are many, many different organizations in the Iranian community that we are going, each of them will go to one type of activity, like for example, uh, cultural, uh, mostly, uh, this is so people describe about that, when this is going to educational, that would be Farangian Educational uh, Association and some of the other associations as Iranian Canadian Healthcare Professional Association that would do. This is the, the next step that we are going to uh, put the association going through the kind of a specialty. It would be more influence and also the other association will help us. That was one of the examples that Civic ICD did, the support of this group. I would like to have some uh, short speech from our supporter too. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nasrin Fisuf. I'm the president and founder of the Canadian Iranian Foundation. Our organization has been established in 2005, and our main uh, objective is to kind of um, provide information for the new immigrant and try to make them integrate into the Canadian society. The other objective and mission that CIF has to give a scholarship to students. Uh, to date, CIF has been given, awarded rather, $300,000 scholarship to many, many students. Uh, we are a part of the society and we would like to definitely encourage all the Iranians to participate in this very, very democratic uh, voting system. We have not been able to do that in our own country. Now it is our chance, now it is our opportunity to get involved. And as you can see, we have so many uh, unique and wonderful people in so many different parties. Please make sure you vote. Your vote matters. Thank you. We are cooperating with the other community, like the Chinese community. Uh, Vincent is from the Chinese community, I would like to have you. Hello everyone, my name is Vincent Wu. I'm, uh, I'm glad to represent the uh, Chai City Chinese News and uh, thank Kay and uh, his group and the, uh, in, in this uh, long weekend afternoon, uh, you guys spent some time and, and uh, seven or ten days in North Shore. It showed the spirit of civic engagement. So and thank you for the platform to provide for the candidate and, and the voter and, and who content about the political political participation in community to, to show up, come up and remember to vote on May 9th. Uh, I'm Vincent Wu and we, we represent the Chinese community. We will have, uh, uh, by the April 29th, we have uh, uh, 
uh, and, and another all candidate meeting in Kokura. So welcome and, and uh, to see more people show up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I am TV from the local media, so uh, without having a media, we cannot spread out our voice. So we would appreciate to have some of us. Thank you. Uh, hello everybody, I'm Ramin Mohseni. I'm representing RATV Vancouver, which is funded uh, two years ago by myself. And we have uh, some uh, uh, multicultural shows on uh, Omni Channel and also on Shaw Multicultural Channel and uh, with uh, cultural and social content on there. So please visit our website, RATV.ca, and watch this video as well. Thank you very much. I'm also a Mr. Kutian as Arangian Educator Association, which published some of the Persian Farsi 1 and 2 based on the uh, educational uh, ministry of the BC. There are some uh, books which has provided for uh, and also uh, proposed to the Ministry of Education for accepting as a Farsi as second language that we introduced. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Kay. Uh, I also thank all candidates in here for the time, and uh, uh, you also in a long weekend. Uh, Fangian Educator Association is proud to uh, represent K to 12 students of this community. We want your children to get to know democratic approaches to all civic events. I want you please to make them informed of this and also your neighbors, all newcomers, Iranians, to come and practice this democratic approach to civic events. And this is the best opportunity we have. And then uh, in the future, I promise that we work with uh, civic association to educate Iranian families toward this kind of event and then how to foresee and be visionary and positive uh, toward the elections. Thank you. And uh, well, actually, my books are here, Farsi 1, Farsi 2, Farsi 3, with uh, practice and grammar books, uh, all written in Canada with ISBN, based on the, in fact, uh, outcomes of Ministry of Education, generated by uh, Iranian teachers at this moment working in, uh, under supervision of uh, Ministry of Education. So uh, we, are, we are inviting, in fact, families to use these books uh, instead of Iranian books that are coming from Iran because unfortunately they are having political and then some religious matters that perhaps you don't want to tell your children. That is a diverse media that is always supporting us. So we would like to have some words from them. Thanks for the opportunity. Hello everyone. <coughs> Sorry. My name is Simo Afarzadeh. I am the director and editor in chef of Hamyari Media. This is a bi weekly magazine in Farsi published in Vancouver in paper and digital. And uh, fairly uh, uh, new, one year old. Uh, we have sent, we try actually to uh, encourage our community <coughs> to vote. Uh, and we have recently sent a survey to all candidates mostly uh, in the area mostly resided by uh, Iranian like North Shore and Tri-Cities and uh, we are uh, trying to uh, in, uh, translate all we receive as soon as possible and to publish before May 9th. So uh, as uh, uh, other people here said, especially um, uh, Ms. Filsuf that uh, stressed on that, please vote, just vote and make you uh, like more, as more knowledgeable as you can and it, it all matters that you vote. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you everyone. And also for the last person I may uh, ask Zahra to come in front. And for this word translation, uh, we had a lot of discussion with many people for finding, for example, one word that, for example, what does exactly mean due process? Or what does exactly mean that we should put over here mobility right? Or what could be, for example, for the ombudsman officer? Because some of these words were 
we didn't have uh, not about it to process about some of the world. We didn't have in Farsi actually. And we had a long discussion and we had some things that Zahra would uh, help us a lot. Uh, and human rights. Uh, so, and human rights. Well, I, I'd like to thank all the candidates again for taking the time to be here. And for all, from all of you, thank you for spending your Saturday afternoon with us. Again, I'm repeating what everybody else has said, but it is really important to get all the information that you can and to just get out there and vote. Thank you. Uh, thanks to everyone else because the time is finished, but just have your name. And I would appreciate because you have a lot. Just say my name. <laughs> my name is Al. <laughs> hey everyone, uh, very quick. Um, I know I'm definitely going to vote. My name is Ali and I'm the first Iranian Canadian who's written a book about personal finances. I got a little booth over there. Uh, it's a pleasure to support this great association. If you want to come, you know, say hello and take a look at the book, I'll be more than happy to, um, you know, uh, talk to you. Thank you very much, everybody, and uh, have a great day. Thank you very much. Uh, we have two more people who are here. Please introduce yourself in short. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. I'm Hale Shirjian. I'm director of CIF. And also acknowledge I'm from GV Counseling and Education Society. Quran is fine there, but I'm, now, I'm here as, as a member of this uh, GV Council. And please vote. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much everyone.